Okay, so Book of Nehemiah, end of recorded history. I'm trying. I keep trying to shrinky dink the um, the review, but you know they've been in Babylon captivity for decades. Let's just call it that and not get technical about it. Yeah. And while they've been in Babylon, a bunch of things, uh, the rise of the importance of the word of God, the rise of the synagogue, and the rise of the idea that, hey, we really are a separate people because they were living in a foreign culture and maintaining their Judaism within that culture, yeah? So um, they began to come back to Jerusalem after the captivity because the king lets them go. Three main movements. The first one, Zerubbabel. <laughs> Whatever, yeah, Mr. Z. And um, they rebuild, um, actually, the, the, the temple, yeah, have the first Passover in 70 years, at least first temple Passover that we're aware of, and first sacrifices at the temple in 70 years. Um, that was the first wave. About 60 years later, a second wave shows up with Ezra, and basically, he is the one that freaks out because they're having mixed marriages, right? Um, which is the second conflict with the local population of well, we say Samaritans, but it was likely a major hodgepodge of people that were living there. But the Samaritans specifically were, had a um, hybrid religion of both pagan god worship mixed in with worship of Yahweh. Um, and so Zerubbabel and Ezra basically say, we, don't, we, we want nothing to do with you people. Uh, and we had a long discussion because they were jerks. No, and the answer really was no. They were taking seriously, we are meant to be a separate people. And if our people intermarry with your people, they will worship your gods. And then remember, one of the interesting things is then what happens with the land? And that's going to come up again tonight. The importance of the land that was supposed to stay within the family of Israelites. And not just like to keep it within the nation, but literally to keep it with the families from to whom it was first given. Hence the, you know, the 49-year jubilee, which was all the land went back to the families. That's the way it was supposed to go. So nobody, so nobody ended up controlling all the land, right? So it was a big deal to them. And that was one of the reasons why the people that were coming back from Babylon were scolding those who had either been there for a while or those who had stayed there, whatever. No, we do not, we do not mix, okay? So um, we're in the third movement now with Nehemiah. It's 90 years since Zerubbabel, right? So think about that, people. That's a long period of time. Um, he's a different kind of guy. He's not a priest or a prophet. He's not even a Levite. He's a, uh, from the tribe of Judah. He is a civil leader, um, hanging out with the king of uh, Persia, Artemis. And um, he gets sort of a um, commission from Artemis to go to be the governor of uh, Judea, and he, he, he has a vision and to rebuild the walls. Now, we say the walls, Nehemiah is famous for rebuilding the walls, but let's always remember it was the gates that were the most important because, you know, when they destroyed a city, they really wouldn't necessarily destroy all the walls, but if they could destroy the gates, it was as good as having no walls because that's, you know, people could come in, and there was 10 gates. So we covered 10 gates um, last week. And um, it was interesting last week because when I started studying for last week, I'm like, how in the heck are we going to talk about rebuilding gates and make it interesting? And yet it was interesting, wasn't it? Like, I, you, well, you all came back anyway. So um, one of the, um, you know, I think, you know, we, we basically went around counterclockwise around and we talked about each gate, its significance, uh, where it is today, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I think everybody's favorite gate was the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate, you know, which I sort of ended up with because there was so much prophecy about that gate that has been answered already and still so much prophecy yet to come around that gate. And there's political things with that gate. And it was just really, it was just uh, really interesting. And we were also encouraged at the end of last week about um, how much modern archaeology has discovered the very things we're looking at here in scripture, they're, find, they're finding it. You know, they, they dig down and lo and behold, there it is, just where Nehemiah says it is. Um, so tonight where we're gonna go is the opposition to the rebuilding is really gonna get fired up. Um, just so you know, I had a little bit of a history hiccup myself tonight or today when I was studying. I couldn't quite figure out why the local People, the local governors um, that we're going to, there's going to be four of them tonight that we're going to look at. How come they all have their own armies? I didn't quite get it. 
So I did a little bit of a deep dive, and I'm just going to tell it to you now ahead of time so we don't have to, you know, when we get there. Um, but what I, because, you know, look, in America, we think of ourselves as, look, we're the nation of America, and within America, we only have one military, right? I mean, I know there's some people up in Idaho, but let's just, oh. <laughs> right, you know. Sorry, anybody from, anybody from Idaho? I want to get shot, yeah, like, yeah. Duck, yeah, yeah. Just teasing. But, um, and, and we can't fathom, like, militaries within America, but that, things were different back then, and that's what I was looking at. And so Persia sort of controls the whole area. They're sort of responsible for all the battles that are going on on the borders with Egypt, but they, you know, they have mid-level rulers working for them that have like their own militias. Does that make sense? And so even though they're all under Persia, they have these, what are they called? Satraps, I think is, I don't know how to pronounce that. That it? Satraps? Yeah, satraps that sort of have their own armies, their own militias in these area. So that's how they're later going to kind of come to blows. And this is why they all armed with spears and swords and things. And then when I was reading that today, it reminded me that book I've read before, the um, bio, uh, um, Jerusalem, a biography, um, that even, I was blown away when I read that book, that even within what we call the Pax Romana, you know what that is? The Peace of Rome, which was historically is called an unusual 400 years of peace because, you know, Rome had flattened everybody out and they'd hung up all the criminals and da-da-da. Well, you know, when you read that book, O Jerusalem, or not O Jerusalem, but Jerusalem of Biology, it's amazing how much violence there is within that 400 years within these little interesting Roman factions. Does that make sense? Because in that book, it's kind of sad, but every three pages, another 10,000 people get slaughtered. I mean, it's awful, but the history of... Jerusalem, and by the way, the name Jerusalem means city of peace. <laughs> Welcome to mankind, people, right? The city of peace is maybe one of the most blood-drenched cities on the face of the earth, and I'd be interested if somebody could think of another one. I mean, there might be one or two big slaughters, but you're talking about a slaughter happening about every 50 years or so, a major slaughter taking place within the, the city walls. So um, my, my point is, when you hear about these guys are going to come against us, you're like, well, where are the Persians? That's what's going on, okay? Sorry, long, long description probably didn't need to go into such detail. But we're going, to, we're going to do two chapters tonight, four and five. So let's jump into chapter four, verse one to three. <clears throat> chapter four. When Sanballat heard that we, we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed, ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, see the army of Samaria, there we go, right? You know, under Persia. Okay. He said, what are, what are those feeble Jews doing? By the way, that's NIV, feeble Jews. What, does anybody have anything else? Amplified. There's feeble. Feeble? Uh, and that's that's poor feeble Jews. A bunch of poor feeble Jews think they're glorious. Okay. That's, that's, anything else? That's about it. Okay. Um, Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from the heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, ha, ha. Like, I threw that part in, yeah? A little, a little, a little dramatic flair, right, yeah? Um, ha, ha, what, are, what, are, what are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Sounded better with a... English accent, didn't it? Yeah. So I could work on that. Maybe French would probably be the best. Yeah. You bloody knickets, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, you know what? I, the first thing I wrote in my notes. Uh, well, first of all, we've covered we've covered Sanballat already. We covered him a couple of weeks ago. He's the governor of Samaria, right? And um, by the way, um, uh, one comment. I think it's actually the NIV Life Application Notes pointed out. He might be incensed because. He realizes that this is a power play by Nehemiah, right? He probably wanted to be the governor of the Judea province, and now he's been sort of cut off by Nehemiah, and he's not, he's not impressed, yeah? But what I also wrote in my notes this morning was, isn't it interesting how people don't change much? Like the mocking of the Jews, it just, the, things they, the very things they say, you could just see people saying that today. Oh, really? What do they think they're going to do there, right? You know? Um, now, it's also interesting that he refers to them, who are these feeble Jews? Now, it's interesting because this is something I read. 
the Sumerians who become the Samaritans, and I don't want to go down that bunny trail. There's a, one letter difference and a little historical difference between Sumerians and Samaritans, but it's not worth going into right now. Um, they probably considered themselves what they would call, ready for this, Yahwists, like Y-A-H, like Yahweh, Yahwists, and they might even considered themselves Israelites, even though they are sort of have a semi-pagan worship system, right? But they're calling them Jews because they are Judahites. And by the way, that's an actual word. I didn't make that up. Judah. Ites because they are of the tribe of Judah, which is where we get, I guess, Jews, okay? Jews, the Judahites, okay, yeah? And um, by the way, the thing they, uh, that one of the insults is, uh, can they bring the stones back to life, right? Now, if you're like a New Testament fan, you're like, oh, this is starting to sound like my world, right? Well, it's an interesting thing. If you burn stone, it becomes brittle, yeah? And not Malle well, not malleable is the wrong word for it, but not useful is the right word for actually building stones and rocks. And so that's why they're insulated. What are they going to use? All that burned rubble? There's no life in those burned rubbles. But most of you are probably pretty aware of what Peter says um, when he says, um, you too have become living, well, living stones. Christ is the cornerstone. You have become living stones, right? Whom God is using to build a temple in which he will be worshiped. And that was a pretty rough paraphrase from the Danard unabridged version of the Bible right there. But basically, in fact, if you ever sat through that stupid sermon I taught about that, when we're not, none of us are cornerstones, we're little rocks, we're pebbles that bear fruit. Fruity pebbles, anybody, really? Yeah. Okay, 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 never mind, never mind. So, um, okay, so in response, Nehemiah lovingly says, Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. <laughs> Give them over as a plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So, I hadn't thought about this, but one of the commentators used the word imprecatory, and I hadn't thought about that since we taught imprecatory psalms when we went through the book of Psalms. That was a real fun definition word because everybody loves that word, imprecatory. Imprecatory is a psalm that invokes judgment, calamity, and curses on the enemies of God. And there's actually some pretty humorous examples of that. You know, because on the one hand, you have David saying, oh, God, uh, you know, as he say, oh, against you and you only have I sinned. Have mercy on me, a sinner, God. But would you smash the heads of those unrighteous people? And it caused some really interesting conversations of who does David think he is to ask for mercy, but call down judgment? And those Psalms, and there's a lot of them where he calls down judgment. God, go get those people. They're called imprecatory. And this is sort of an imprecatory prayer um, on, the, on the behalf um, of Israel. And um, I just noticed it's again, um, remember, he's not a priest. He's not a prophet. He is a civic leader, yeah, who clearly has a biblical background and has probably read a number of David's imprecatory psalms because that sounds almost like right from the mouth of David right there, yeah? Um, by the way, there's also a little mention, uh, interesting thing here. I, I left it out, verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. And, and it's just um, a small thing. But it's better to close all the gaps at half a height than to have big gaping right. holes or whatever. But most importantly, it really is interesting, or not interesting, but encouraging. The people worked with all their heart. So this is like a big shout out. Um, to, to those people that work. So then, then here's where it gets, um, well, here's where they come under opposition. Chapter seven, uh, verse seven. Um, when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God 
and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Now, what I found interesting about this little passage is the list of opposition is significant because it represents all four corners of the, um, what do you call those things? Compasses, thank you, yeah. Now listen, um, on the north, in fact, I'm kind of proud of myself that I knew some of this. I knew um, the Samaritans were on the north side. Um, I guessed wrong about who was to the east. I assume the Arabs be to the east, but apparently Tobiah was the, remember he was the leader of the Ammonites. The Ammonites were to the east of Jerusalem and the Arabs, remember what was his name? They gave it, um, uh, they gave it last week, Kehob or something. I forget. I'm not going to go look at it, but they give the actual name of the leader. Not Kebab. <laughs> he can get away with it because he's Assyrian. So his people have a long history of insulting the Arabs, yeah. Carrying out God's bidding. Carrying out, you're right, you got it, all right, yeah. So we got, on the north side is the Samaritans, to the east is the Ammonites, to the Arabs is the south, and the Philistines, which is the town of Ashdod, are to the west on the Mediterranean side. Now, immediately what I found interesting about that is it's sort of a prequel to the War of 1967, isn't it? When they were attacked by Lebanon from the north, Jordan from the east, Egypt from the south, and I don't really have anybody from the west uh, specifically, but we can also add Syria. I guess you could almost say Lebanon. Yeah, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Very, yeah. very similar, right? So... Yeah, they got Gaza. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, coming coming up from there. So in any case, it's interesting that like there is a historical precedent from sort of being surrounded by your enemies on all four sides. Okay, I thought that was interesting. Um, and then I love his response. Um, wait, where did I go? Um, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And I immediately thought of that quote and I went and looked it up so now I know who said it. Have you ever heard this quote? Trust God, but keep your powder dry. Yeah. Anybody know who said that without looking at their phone and Googling it quick? Trivial Pursuit? I didn't know, by the way. I looked it up today. Oliver Cromwell in 1649. And that's not the full quote, that's the short version. He's like, come on, boys, and da-da-da, but trust ye, trust ye in the Lord with all ye heart at all times, and keep ye powder dry. And it makes sense, right? I mean, yeah, we trust God, but we got a job to do. Right. Do your job right and trust God. Like, those things work right. hand in hand. By the way, I heard a great sermon uh, two days ago on the North Shore about faith and works, and it fits perfectly. And you're going to hear it, you're laughing, it was me. <laughs> you're going you're to hear it in two weeks. Um, you're, in two weeks, I'll be preaching that same sermon here. Uh, it's James chapter 2, 14 to 26 or whatever it is. Yeah, faith and works, yeah. Where, who's, where, where's Don and Don? These guys, these guys, James and Nancy and Don. And, and they, were, they were like, it was okay. <laughs> don't, don't believe him. <laughs> Sleep in that Sunday. But it, anyways, but yeah. Have faith in God, trust God, keep your powder dry. I like that idea. We had faith in God, we posted a guard. Love it, yeah? How's God going to protect us? With that guard, right? Okay, good stuff. Okay, so, um, okay, let's read verses 10 to 14. You're on deck. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us, and I love this, 10 times over. Hyperbole people, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Yeah. Therefore, um, is that, am I that? Yeah, I'm going to keep going. Therefore, I stationed some people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords spears and bows, and after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your homes. There he is again. Remember who's on our side. 
And remember who you fight for. I love that, yeah? And so, by the way, in the Hebrew, when it says the strength of the laborers is giving out, it literally means in the Hebrew they are stumbling under the weight of the job that they have um, been giving them. Notice also they're getting messages from other Jews around them. Some people have thought that meant they already had an intelligence section. You know, they were already had you know, spies going out there, yeah? But it's a twofold motivational speech singing, saying this, we fear God and so will they, right? Yeah? And then the classic, you know, fight for your families, which really is like, because where else are you going to go? This is it. This is like the home turf. There's no retreating to somewhere else. This is where we're making our stand. And um, I texted Jungle Jen today because I was like, um, I've, if you've watched her video, and if you haven't, you should, and she can give you details on how you can see it. Uh, it's basically, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, it's like a day in the life of an Amazonian missionary. And in that one day, she undergoes about 25 different trials. <laughs> and, and by the way, one, one might be one trial with four subsections. It starts out rough, and then it gets harder, and then it gets harder. And then she fixes that thing only to have everything else go wrong or whatever. And I knew that part of her calling from God is to motivate the troops when things don't go wrong. And so I asked Jen if she would share a little bit today uh, or tonight about, yeah, her life as sort of a motivator. So from 2010 to 2012, I lived in the Mayaruna people group and planted a church. For those of you who don't know, they were an unreached people group. And then from there, I took people from that church. And then we went out and we evangelized and we passed out Bibles. That's what we did. And then in 2016, so we're just talking like four years later, right? 2016, I have a, what I called a divine encounter with someone. So have you ever had an opportunity where you met somebody who you know God put you together? Have you had that? Well, mine was with Kokama, okay? <laughs> he was the chief of the Kokama tribe and called himself Kokama. Real humble man, just ask him. Okay, so Kokama and I meet in a very odd place in a very odd way. And as I'm sharing with him about the Lord, because this is a huge opportunity, he's getting more and more excited. And I shared with him about our Bibles, because that's what we do. I shared with him about these rice and bean bags that we have. He got really excited. They're like packed with nutrients for the high water season. And he said, you've got to come and you've got to meet my people. So I arranged a time to do that. And when we did, I took a missionary colleague of mine, Jai Olson, with me. We get to the Kokama tribe. Chief Kokama comes running down and he's screaming to everyone, the white one is here, the white one is here, you have to come and meet her. So everybody comes out, all these people from the tribe come down to the water, we get off the canoes, and he's just going crazy going, this is the white one I was telling you about, she's the one with the rice and bean bags, she's the one with those Bible things, she's the one with that God, and she's going to build us a church. <laughs> And Jailson looks at me and goes, you're going to do what? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to do huh? <laughs> and in that moment, I had a choice. I could either say, oh, gosh, no. I, I don't know how to build a church. I don't know anything about building a building. I didn't even like to play with Legos as a kid. <laughs> no way. I don't have the money for that. No way. Or I could say, we're going to build a church. <laughs> okay, so what do you think I did, right? Sure. Right, right. Okay, good. So then I go off into the jungle and I'm like, dear Lord, what have I agreed to do? I can't do this. There's no way. And Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, if you'll just show up, mm. I'll do the rest. Oh, wow. Right. If you'll just show up, I'll do the rest. So I decided first to go back to the city and call the mission to let them know what I had just agreed to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And as I called, one of our assistants answered and she said, Jen, Jen, I can't wait to hear how things are going. Hey, before you get into anything, I've got you on speakerphone. We have a really strange thing that just happened. Oh, wow. So the company that provides the rice and bean bags just had a designated gift that was given. 
And I don't know if there's anything you can do about it, but they've called us and they've gotten this large sum of money to build a church. (laughs) (laughs) I said, well, that's so interesting. I'll pray about it. (laughs) We're going to build a church. We went from this here. Mm -hmm. This was the land we were given. Okay, this land. To this, wow! In 28 days. Wow! Unreal. 15 days into the building project, we realized we didn't even have a sketch of what we wanted the building to look like. <laughs> we just kept showing. No, I don't know that was a good idea, but that, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it worked. It worked. <laughs> But it was because we just kept showing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he would do the rest. And then, yeah. 21 days into the building project, we found out that our pastor, who was going to lead this, had just gotten a 15 year old in the tribe pregnant. Go. Oh. Mm-hmm. oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. About 22 days in, they come up to me and they said, Jen, we need more sand. Sand? <laughs> what? Now, I don't want to look stupid, right? I'm the leader of this project. So I said, if I was to get you sand, what would you do with it? (laughs) And they said, well, we'd build a fourth wall. I said, you build walls with sand? They said, no, you make cement with sand. (laughs) Hence why I married a contractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) And I said, oh, okay, okay, all right. So I went to my prayer tree out there in the jungle, and I said, oh, Lord, would you like your church to have three walls or four? <laughs> totally up to you. <laughs> and he, he said, go get in the canoes. Go get in the canoes? Mm. All right, now, you're the leader, right? So you've got to, like, act like you know what you're doing. So I get real excited, <laughs> and I run down there, like, let's go get in the canoes. And they're like, get in the canoes? Why, well, why would we do that? At this point, we had an extra 60 feet of water in the Amazon. So we're talking a ton of water. So we go down, we get in the canoes, and we're canoeing, and we're canoeing, and we're canoeing, and we're canoeing, and just canoeing, and they're complaining, and they're grumbling, and all of a sudden, somebody shouts, Look! A beach! (laughs) Sand. Sand. Seven canoe trips back and forth. We had a fourth wall. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Because I'm telling you that it's your will that will get you there, Nehemiah. Mm-hmm. But it's your calling that will keep you there. Mm-hmm. And that's what I learned through all of this. And I just want you also to know that we got to baptize that girl, the 15-year-old, oh, wow. at eight months pregnant. She gave her life to Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Oh, and wow. though we had some bumpy starts at the beginning of that church, they're now the strongest church we've got. Unreal, we yeah. just oh, ordained wow. another nine while we were just there. Wow. Unreal, because yeah. it's thriving. So sometimes what we see is the hard stuff. If you're called to do it, he'll provide for it. Mm -hmm. And then it will be more than you could ever ask for. Amen, yeah. Called to it, yeah. Thanks, Jen. (laughs) You know, you want to like, you know why that's so perfect is because I was preparing today. I'm reading about, I read Nehemiah say this whole thing about, you know, remember the Lord who's great and awesome. And I'm thinking, hmm, what should I use for an illustration? And apparently the Holy Spirit said, why don't you call Jungle Jen? (laughs) And I I didn't know that story. Just, you know, that was the first time for me right there. Actually, I've heard the 15-year-old girl because that was part of another story, but I remember. But I'd never heard that story, how the thing got built, right? And so I text Jen, hey, are you on the island? I was going to text, you still go to this church? Because I hadn't seen him in two weeks, yeah. I said, are you, are you on the island? And she goes, well, we just landed. And I said, oh, something along the lines of, you're probably not going to come to Bible study because you've been traveling. And she's like, John says we're coming. I said, so I said, could you share tonight? And how perfect was that? Did that like fit perfect? I mean, even your story was so Holy Spirit inspired it even fit tonight's teaching perfect and it just popped into my head that you of all people probably had a good story about how to motivate troops so great thank you jen that was awesome okay so let's move on to the um what do you call citizen soldier or builder soldier yeah what do you call the guys that do brick 
Mason. Mason, yeah. <laughs> Mason's, Mason's, Mason's soldiers. Verses 15. Um, uh, when, the, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. And from that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall, and those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. So again, notice how you know, they're not just seeming like they're preparing for some local thugs, right? This sounds like they're, they're ready to do battle with an army. I mean, it even said the army of the Sumerians, yeah? So um, half of the young men, and by the way, it's, the Hebrew word is the young men will stand guard. So they're straight up soldiers, yeah? Now, amongst the work, workers, you have a few different types. You have the burden bearers. That's like the Hebrew word. They bear the burdens and they are to carry a sword in their right hand and I guess carry rocks. I was going to say bricks, but you know, rocks and mortar with their other hand or what have you. Um, and then you have the stone masons who actually need both hands to work. So they're told to keep their sword in their sheath. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then you have the trumpeter, um, which by the way, the Hebrew word, shofar. Kind of cool, yeah? Yeah, the shofar. How cool is that, yeah? Um, and it says here to, he's to be with, boy, my voice is going, let's hope I get through this, with Nehemiah. Um, but it's interesting because um, the Hebrew is a little sketchy right there about was it one trumpet or trumpeters? And Josephus, the Jewish historian who was around at the time of Christ, he wrote down that there was... Um, did I write it out? Yeah, there was a trumpeter every 500 feet all around the walls to sound the alarm. And then you sort of have the impression that um, Nehemiah, what a guy, he's sort of manning the whole thing, right? So he's directing not only construction, but he's well aware of where his soldiers are, where his armament, I mean, imagine that. It's like, you know what it made me think about is um, military engineers. What do they call those CBs? What do you? Army C Corps of Engineers. Army Corps of Engineers or CBs. And by the way, I was going to ask you military guys this. I imagine those guys, they're trained to fight as well. I don't know. Because I, I really, I don't know much about the CBs, but I imagine they, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I imagine they build things under fire because sometimes, right, they're trying to put a bridge together. Is that right? Yeah, yeah is that right? What's, we, what is it? We build, we fight. Is that their motto? I knew you guys would know that. Thank you. That's awesome. We build, we fight. Okay, excuse me while I take a sip here. Mm. And then let's, um, let's finish the chapter and we'll pause for questions and comments. Um, then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Where, wherever, I like that, you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. And that fits your testimony beautifully, Jen. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And at that time I said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and workmen by day. And neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. By the way, the Hebrew on that is not necessarily that. Um, each had his weapon even when he went for water. In fact, that whole last sentence it's not just contra it's not really controversial. Most people are like, yeah, we don't really not exactly sure what they're trying to say. There's something about water, doing laundry, maybe. We didn't wash our clothes. It's kind of unclear what they mean there. Um, however, um, work usually stopped at sunset, but it sounds like they worked until they could see the stars, which is far after um, set, sunset, because speed is of the F essence. And there is also evidence that um, they had help from Jews who lived outside the city walls would actually come in from 
they did like if they weren't working on the walls during the day, if they were out in their fields and da da da, they would send people to actually guard Jerusalem at night so the people that were building walls could get a good night's sleep. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, um, a lot, a lot more to say about that in the application about teamwork and watching each other's back. And I've got some some applications, but um, we have one more chapter to do. It's not necessarily deep, and we should get through it pretty quickly. But it, uh, at this juncture, does anybody have a question? Uh, or a comment thus far in the building of the walls with all that. That was kind of a lot. Well, Nehemiah had permission from the king, so he had authority to build these walls. Yes. The people attacking him would have to do it deceptively, somehow. Because they can't just overtly go after him because they had permission. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, how, did, how were they able, since he had the authority to rebuild the walls, where do they, where, who do they think they were? And... And, and I, would, I would agree, so they're either being subversive about it, maybe they're empty threats, and knowing that if they did attack, they were likely to get killed. But I would also say that my guess is that kind of thing probably happened all the time. Well, gee, king of Persia, we didn't mean to kill them all, but <laughs> right, right? <laughs> they attacked us first. What were we to do? You know, I don't know what. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, a good point. it's a good point, though, yeah. Anybody else? Should we just keep going? Okay, let's keep going. Okay, the, the narrative takes a total left turn out of nowhere, right? Left turn. It just completely swings in a different direction. So much so that some people are not sure if it's um, chronologically correct um, that they stopped in the middle of this wall building to air grievances and figure something out. I don't know. I, it's I, how would I know? I hard to say. But basically, let's let's just read it. It's called the um, internal strife because of the oppression of the poor, and here's their complaints from chapter five. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers, and some were saying, "We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain." And others were saying. We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. And still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have had to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Okay, so... Um, they are crying out against their fellow Jews. Um, my, my NIV Life Application Bible points out that there's a couple possibilities. One is that some of the families that have been there for 90 years have got all set up, you know? They're, they're, they're rocking. They've got land, they've got sheep, they're growing food, you know, and here come the, new, you know, the newcomers, right? And, and the newcomers are trying to get started with work or what have you, and they're, they're being taken advantage of. Um, others, it's, it's also possible um, because, you know, we have historical evidence that the Jews that, stay, that were in Babylon did really well, yeah? Mm -hmm. That they brought money with them, you know? Gosh, how much did Zerubbabel bring? But no, that was all for the temple, I guess, or whatever. But that people brought money with them, and so, you know, you know how the world works, right? You know? And... Um, I went looking for evidence today. You know, they have a similar thing going on in Israel right now. I don't know if you know this, but since 1948 in the mass immigration, um, there's, to this day, there's, I want to say it's conflict. That's maybe too heavy of a word, but between people that just arrived from Russia, from, well, all over the planet, you know, Ethiopia, right now they're getting a lot of influx of Jews from Ethiopia, you know, and it's not everybody welcome with open arms, rainbows, and unicorns, right? Um, the government works very hard to find housing and jobs for all uh, people that make, what is it called? Aliyah? Aliyah? That's when you, you're Jewish and you decide to move to Israel. But guess what's happening in modern day Israel? Wealthy people are, you know, taking advantage of their situation as new immigrants are coming in and new immigrants are finding it hard to find, you know, get their, get their foothold in economically uh, or what have you, yeah. And um, so it's interesting that things kind of going on even now. But by the way, I tried to find examples, but try to enter in the word conflict and Israel and get any kind of internal conflict. 
I was going page after page of Google looking at it. Anyways, forget it. I just know that I, when I was there hearing stories about it, yeah? Um, okay, so um, by the way, a lot of the verses we just read right there, there's a lot of similar language in the book of Leviticus, yeah? Because remember, um, Jews are never to enslave a fellow Jew. They are allowed to have a bond servant, which is different than being a slave, right? But how long did that last for? Until, well, until, well, actually, or, or until the next Jubilee, when everybody went back, all the bond servants were released and all the land, remember, went back to the family from whence it started. It's kind of complicated, not worth really going through altogether right now, but basically, if you were deeply in debt, you could offer yourself up as a bond servant and give up your land, as it were, right? And maybe be allowed to continue to work your land as a bond servant. But then you're, say, it depended on how close you were to the Jubilee time, how much you got. Does that make sense for your land and for yourself? Because everybody knew, well, if you only got 10 years left, it's all going to go back to you then, you know, but if it's 40 years, you might get more, but whatever. Okay. So, um, but in any case, what was happening here was far worse. And that was selling their sons and daughters to Gentiles to make mortgages and thing. And this has never been cool with God to see the story of Joseph, to see how he feels about it, yeah? Mm. Um, okay, so Nehemiah obviously gets a little upset in verse six. There's, I don't know of any evidence it was ever done ever, to tell you the truth. I'm not aware of it ever. Now, most people believe that the reason they went into captivity for 70 years in the first place was because of the lack of jubilees over the last few hundred years. Remember when God says the land will get rest. its rest, right? And so you owe me X amount of years and I will take you from the land so the land gets its Sabbath, right? Yeah. So just so you know, it's a wonderful economic system, just no evidence they ever did it. Yeah? Okay. So this isn't taking place while they're building the wall. That's the big debate. Nobody knows. Did they actually stop building the wall to have this big rally? No, no, no. I oh. mean, like, are they having to, to farm out their sons and daughters because they're spending time building the wall, and so that's why? Just that's, to make ends meet? That's also unclear as well. But we are imagining it's, it's a few things, okay? Because Marilee's right. It was a time of famine. Right. It's very possible that people are spending their time building their walls and not working, not getting paid right. to work and work their fields. And it's for, not even possible, but it is for sure that all these shenanigans were going on long before they started building the wall. Guaranteed, it probably started 90 years earlier, right? When the first people showed up is probably where it has its roots but it's all coming to a head. And since we're talking about it this way, even before I read, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. A couple of things here. It's probably very possible that what's bringing all of this to a head right now is this mutual working and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The mutual goal that they have. And what you have going on right now, and we know because we've seen evidence of it last week, we have nobles, Except for uh, what town? Anybody remember? It sounds like Hawaiian. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tacoa. <laughs> now, I think they singled out the nobles of Tacoa to make a point that all the other nobles did work. So picture this. We have nobles working side by side, bumping elbows with peasants. And I'm wondering if that wasn't some of the catalyst to make people go, you know, <laughs> Irving here, or whatever, right, is like, sold my daughter. And now, you know, he's handing me rocks. Like, this isn't right. Like, something isn't right. Like, this thing has, pro my guess is this thing has been simmering, yeah. and the project is what has brought this up. By the way, we don't know if that's exactly what happened. I'm, I'm speculating, but I'm not the only one. Other people have speculated the same thing. Okay, so Nehemiah gets extremely upset. But it's a great question, you guys. Thank you. Um, when I heard their outcry and charges, I was very angry, and I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. From um, your own countrymen, exclamation mark that's not in the Hebrew, 
So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles, and now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us, which I'm not exactly sure how that worked, but they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. So first of all, he's extremely upset, but I know a lot of people pointed this out. Notice that I pondered them in my mind, <laughs> and then I, he paused to think about what he was going to say, so he clearly didn't just lash out, yeah? Now, it's interesting because usury, just so you know, people were allowed to loan money or loan land or whatever and profit from it. Um, I kind of did a deep dive into this and went down a bunny trail. The gist of it is, and it's kind of confusing and it involves percentages and I didn't quite get my head all the way around it yet. The gist of it is you're allowed to profit but not take advantage of and squeeze people. In fact, I think I even wrote down, you can't, it inf usury inf infers unfair profit, unfair profit, right? Or taking advantage of. And my thought I had was when I go to visit my kids at Grand Canyon University, which is a beautiful campus in a ghetto, <laughs> And right on the corner, I mean, it is like homeless world right there next to her campus. And smack dab in the middle is a checks cashed payday loans. Yep. And have you ever heard the stories behind how those, how those companies work, how they get people, you know, you can get an advance on your paycheck, but then the interest rates are like 25, 30 percent or whatever. And it's interesting how people sort of have this natural, intuitive sense of what's fair and what's not fair. You know what I mean? I mean, we, you know, our mortgages in this room right here probably are between, you know, two and eight or something. And we all recognize that, oh yeah, it goes up and it goes down, but you get to 30%, come on people, right? You know, and these poor people that go into these checks cashed, you know, payday loan places or whatever, if you've ever watched this documentary on it, they get sucked into a cycle of owing that, you know, their, their checks shrinky, shrinky, shrinky dink until they just, you know, they lose it all together. Anyways, okay, so a similar thing here. By the way, notice Nehemiah gathers a mob of people. That's not my word. That was another commentator. He gathers like a bunch of people, which ought to be fairly intimidating because, again, they're the people that they're all working together with, right? Now they all know each other really well. They've been working side by side, yeah? And then he, he makes his accusation and... Uh, Okay, yeah. Oh, by the way, Yahweh had rescued them from slavery. He was their sole owner. And historically, and this is interesting, Jews, perhaps more than most peoples, will resist their own, um, selling their own people into slavery and will search out Jews and, and ransom them just because they're Jewish. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Isn't that an interesting thing there, yeah? And it was considered sort of shameful for you to know that you had a family member that was in slavery. Whereas other cultures, not so much. Maybe easy come, easy go. But Jews specifically, it was considered like, you know, God's people should not be slaves. Yeah. Why? Because we were rescued from slavery. So therefore, it was shameful to sell somebody into slavery. And it was even shameful to have a member of your family in slavery. And then, you know, even later on, you know, historically, if they discovered there was, you know, enslaved Jews, they would go get them and, and, and buy them out. Yeah. So again, underlying all of this is they're working together. And um, I forget who said this, Harrington speculated that they were losing income because they were working on the walls. And so the outcome of this, oh, I got to hurry up, we're almost out of time. And the outcome of all of this in verse nine is they can't give it all back. So I continued, what you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you are charging them the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. And I'm not going to get into that because it's not worth it and we don't have time. But we will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as they say, which all sounded well and good, but Nehemiah is not stupid. Then I summoned the priests and I made the nobles and officials take an oath. <laughs>
to do what they had promised. And I also shook out the folds of my robe and I said, in this way may God shake out his house and possessions every man who does not keep this promise. So may such a man be shaken out and emptied, right? Okay. Yeah, so there's like all of this is done before God with oaths and everything. And apparently it worked, yeah? Um, They all give it out. And then Nehemiah humbly pointing out how unselfish he is. (laughs) And I'm being a little little facetious on that, but bear with me. we'll We'll read through the end of the chapter. Moreover, from the 20th year of the king of Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until his 32nd year, 12 years, Because remember, he goes back. Uh He builds the walls and the gates, and he goes back. Because remember, King Artaxerxes said, you're coming back, right? Yeah, he agreed to come back. Now, remember, historically, he went back to Jerusalem again, but he retired in in, um, Persia, in Susa was the name of the town, yeah? Neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them, in addition to food and wine, their assistants also lorded it over the people, but out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall, and all my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, a 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me and every 10 days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on the people. Remember me with favor, oh my God, for all I have done for these people. Yeah. 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 He, he, was, he was definitely getting supported. Um, it sounds a little bit like Paul, you know, in the book of Acts, or book of Acts. Is it Acts where he says, hey, you know, I worked, you know, I, I made tents. I worked for you. I never asked anything from you, right? I didn't ask anything, I, you know. And there's something really awesome about setting um, the example. And, and by the way, Jesus totally riffs on this. What this is, is servant leadership, okay? And notice we all think of it because of those words, I did not lord it over them, because Jesus says a very similar thing. In Mark chapter 10, 41, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And by the way, I've read those verses at almost every wedding I've ever performed, yeah? Because it is the model of servant leadership, yeah? We are to focus more on serving one another, yeah? Um, uh, Yamauchi said this, Nehemiah's behavior as governor was guided by principles of service rather than opportunism, yeah? And um, kind of like the guys that serve in Congress, right? They're not getting rich. Did you hear there's a guy? There's a guy that does a whole thing on buying stocks. And all he does, I'm not going to give you their names, but you probably know who I'm going to say anyways. All he does is he makes the exact same trades that certain Congress people make. Just whatever they buy, he buys. Isn't that interesting? Seems to be working out really well. Don't know how that works out so well, but it just does, is what I'm saying, yeah? Um, But I want you to know, too, that um, we try to practice that around here, KCF, to the best of our ability. We're not in this for the money. Uh, We're not in this to sort of, like, we don't make decisions based on how, how can we squeeze the congregation for more money, what have you. And an example came up, and again, I'm not like trying to pat myself on the back on this, but it came up from somebody else. In fact, I think it was somebody in this room who basically said this out of concern for us. They said, well, how much more work is the Anchor House making, since I have Anchor House students here? Um, Well, quite frankly, gave us all a bunch more work because it added two more teachings a week, which just so you know, teaching's a lot of work. And it's like what we do, whatever. And somebody said, are you getting compensated for that extra work. 
And I just kind of laughed, I'm like, no, that's not the way we roll around here, right? But what I said was this, one thing I've learned is my whole experience working with Rick and his zany ideas is in the beginning, you just do whatever you do and eventually compensation might come, you know? I, 10 years, I was worship leader before I ever got a paycheck out of this church, right? And now I, I, it's wonderful. I make a living out of doing this, teaching. It's amazing. It's like, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy it. And Anchor House, quite frankly, no, it's a lot more work for all of us. We don't take any money, but nobody, nobody complains. Nobody ever even, even blinked. In fact, nobody even suggested that that came from the outside because we get that this is just what we do. But quite frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually the Anchor House might end up being my retirement. I don't know. Maybe, but I can see, I've seen how God does, you know, it works. You just, you, you show know, up, God will do the rest. You show up, God will do the rest, and God gives you something to do, because you know what my ideal retirement would be? I'd love to travel somewhere six months of the year and be like, you know, special guest pastor in the, I don't know, Indonesia near a point break. <laughs> I know there's people watching right now that they're flying me out to can they're flying me out to Kansas to preach in September, right? You know, it's not what I was thinking about my six months out of the year, and then be here in the winter as at sort of adjunct professor at Anchor House. Does that make sense? Yeah, and let and and receive my income from that would be wonderful. I don't know. I just all I'm telling you, I don't. I'm not even hoping that happens. I'm just like I don't know. We just do what we do, right? And we let God take care okay i i never want to think of it as us lording it over anybody like i just my cringe at the thought you know and by the way you know people people have a weird expectation you know people who aren't believers will call me to complain about people in this church and no what they think i'm gonna go do is go straighten that guy out <laughs> isn't that crazy like they think that's how we roll like, can you imagine I just <laughs> called you up and was like, I have a concern about you. It's been brought to my attention. You know, you haven't paid your bar tab at Kiyoki's. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of Christian do you think they think we are around here? You know, whatever. Right? Lord, Lord it over. But servant leadership is, servant leadership is, we do what we think is best for everybody. Does that make sense? Yeah? Not best for us. But how do we, you know, lead the, everything is for the group, for the best of everybody, which, by the way, it's an interesting thing. Tom knows this, and I'll be done here. Sorry, I've gone on two minutes too long. I'll wrap up with this thought. Tom knows this. What the difference is between, say, a worship leader, a youth pastor, or even a teaching pastor and an elder, yeah, is when you're a youth pastor, even children's pastor, whatever, you sort of are always advocating for your ministry, right? But an elder looks at all the ministries and often says no <laughs> to the individual because we can't do that right now. And quite frankly, no offense, Anchor House ladies that are back there. But right now, a lot of resources are going into Anchor House right now that are denying resources to other ministries. But there's a reason behind that, because right now we're building Anchor House, right? Right now we have 25 students. It's meant to be 40. And so we're taking a loss, but at the same time, we're trying, we're trying to scrape together the money to build the lecture hall. Does that make sense? The landscaping, the paving, there's, it's, it's a work in project. We're building the walls, right? And so we all know how it works. Once Anchor House is up and fully functioning, then things will move Things will move somewhere else. Did you know we're putting in turn lanes out here? And can I just let you know we sort of have to by the county ordinance before we build another <laughs> outhouse, we have to put a turn lane in. But I'm a big advocate because nobody makes that left turn off the highway more than I do, four times a day on average. And man, one time I just barely got out of there and the guy rear-ended the guy behind me. It's sketchy. I'm like, I'm all, all in favor of a turn like me. Yeah. Okay. Let's script all the applications. Father God.
Thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you for your lessons about getting things done with faith in you, Lord, and posting guards, Lord. We pray, we plan, we post. <laughs> Lord, we don't post and then plan and then pray for the disaster that we created, God. We pray first, we seek your guidance, then we plan, and then we get busy, Lord, seeking you first, Lord. If I could leave everybody here tonight with one most important lesson, that would be it. So may we always keep this lesson in mind for all the things that we plan to do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.